Well, guys, I'm super excited to be here preaching with you guys today. Um, Nathan is back at his farm enjoying a day off and resting and actually being thankful for rest. So um, I'm excited to be here with you guys. My wife and I just got back from Georgia on Friday, um, and it was a great time. I love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is amazing. I have never flown during holiday times before. Um, now I will say we got really lucky. We flew out a hobby and not bush which is great because my wife does not like airplanes and airports because social anxiety. But here's the thing. We survived, and we're excited to be here with you guys today. Um, I will let you know something. If, you, if you're a man in this room, and I'm so sorry for what I'm about to say, uh, if you have ever tried to pee standing up in an airplane, it is horribly impossible, <laughs> slightly impossible. I'm an overachiever. But I don't know about you. I tend to leave Thanksgiving with a catch-22. I am really thankful to be with friends and family. Um, it was an amazing time for us to go back to Georgia, but here's the catch-22. I usually tend to leave a little heavier than I came, and I don't know about you, but I have no help necessary to gain weight. So here's the thing. Han and I have been here for three months now which I think is crazy. Time has flown by that for a quarter of a year, we live in an entirely different state with an entirely different church family, and it's amazing. And here's, if I'm being honest with you, I need to tell you guys something about y'all, okay? I am blown away by our church for several different things. And the first one is, you guys love really, really well. Um, we have been very welcomed, not only by you guys, but also I just am excited to see the way you guys love on each other. And I'm also excited by your faithfulness to Jesus. And I think we're in a really unique place as a church because we're eight months old. I don't know if you still think about that, but we have not even hit the fact that we have not existed as a church for a year. And the way you guys love people is incredible, incredible. So here's the deal. We have this incredible core of people, right, really faithful, really loving people. But what is the next step for us as a church? And so here's the thing. Nathan and I have talked about this a lot. We talked about it all the way back before I even came here, just in my interview. And here's what we want. We want our people, and that's you, to do three things. We want you to love Jesus. We want you to love one another we want you to share the love of Jesus with the lost world. And if I'm being really honest, we do a great, and I mean a great job at the first part of that. But really where we're going as a church and what the next step for us is to take these last two things, to love people and love a lost world really well, that's the areas that we get to work on together. And so here's the thing. Nathan and I have talked about the vision of this church tons of times. And I love it because there's several things that's really cool about this church. The first one is we get to establish a culture instead of change a culture. The second thing is that we are building things from the ground up and you guys get to be a part of that. And that's amazing. But what really excites me is the vision that Nathan has had for reaching people in this church since the moment he started it. Are you ready for it? I got one head nod. Cool. <laughs> Here's the vision. And it's a big one. We want to see the entire city of Katy reached for Jesus. The whole city, not just part of it. We want to see this entire city ignite a flame of passion for our God. And I truly believe this is not a grand dream. I don't think this was something that Nathan just thought up. What I believe is that this is a promise that God has given us if we are faithful to take the grace and truth of the gospel out of these doors. So if you have your Bibles with you today, you can go ahead and turn to Mark 2. We're going to look at the story of the healing of the paralytic. And this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, it's, a, it's an action packed. It's crazy. Things happen so fast in it. But I think there's some things that we can look at this today, and we can look at some ways that we can learn to practically be missional and learn what it looks like to reach Katie. for Jesus. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to read Mark 2, 1 through 12. It's also up here. Start in verse 1, it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. And they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. And some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat that the man was lying on. 
And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So as we approach Mark 2, here's what happens, right? Mark 1 tells us that Jesus' fame has spread throughout the regions. One of the things that happens in Mark 1, and if you don't know anything about the book of Mark, it's very action-packed. It's very fast-paced. So everything happens immediately and then and immediately and then. So Jesus heals the demon-possessed man. And here's what happens is immediately he becomes a household name. See, knowing who Jesus was was kind of like us knowing who Dak Prescott is. Regardless of how you feel about him, you know the name. And yes, Nathan is not the only pastor who likes the Cowboys. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. I know I'm in Houston and it's weird. Look, I'll be honest with you. I think it's one of Nathan's great qualities that he's a Cowboys fan. Even if he's playing hooky today, we'll forgive him just this once. So here's the thing. There is no doubt, no doubt that Jesus is the miracle man. He's the guy to be. He's the guy to be around. And he is the guy to be in the same room with. And so when Mark 2 starts, that's exactly the scenario that we find Jesus in. He is back in Capernaum. He's been there before. Now he's back and he's staying in a house. Now tradition says that it may have been Peter's house. We don't really know that. But here's the thing. He sits down and he's in this house, right? And look what happens in verse 2. It says, they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So here's the thing. There's no room. There's no room inside There's no room outside. There's just no room, period. And these were not sturdy brick houses. These were not mansions built up with columns and concrete foundations. Houses back then a lot of times were really just sticks and mud put together with a a roof made of palm leaves. And so it's very likely that people were literally tearing down walls to be in the same place as Jesus today. So Jesus does... What Jesus does, right? He starts preaching. And so Jesus is preaching, but something happens almost immediately. In the middle of him teaching, suddenly the roof is ripped away, and this man is lowered down before Jesus. And Jesus looks up, and he sees the men that lowered him down, and he sees their faith. And Jesus, in that moment, forgives the sins of the paralytic. Now, Scripture tells us that there are scribes who are in the room. Now, if you know anything about scribes and Pharisees, there's plenty of times in Scripture where they oppose Jesus, where they challenge Jesus. But at least in this moment, they are very interested in Jesus. So they find themselves in the room there. And they're shocked. Because in their hearts, inside, they're saying, who is this guy? Like, how can he claim to forgive sins? This is blasphemy. Only God forgives sins. And it says that Jesus perceives in their hearts, and he issues a response. And I love it because it's, it's like the typical Jesus fashion that we don't talk about. In a, in a really modern way, Jesus is looking at them and going, what is wrong with you? That's what he's saying. He says, what's wrong with you? Is it not easier for me to forgive sins? Is it not easier just to speak this out than to make this man walk? They said, just because you claim I don't have authority, I'll show you authority. And so what does Jesus do is he tells the paralytic to get up. And so in this moment, Jesus is demonstrating his power. He's demonstrating his authority. He's showing that he is who he claims to be, right? That he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, the Redeemer, the one who takes away the sins of the world, just like John proclaimed, right? And so this story, what happens is this lame man, this paralytic who is lowered down, not only gets his sins forgiven, but he walks away healed. He gets up and walks out. And people are amazed at what happens. They say they have never seen anything like this. See, this story is one of great faith. 
It's the faith of the paralytic's friends that they would even lower him down into the roof. And it's the faith of the paralytic that he would get up and walk out. But not only is it a story of their faith, this story is also an incredible parallel to how we are supposed to walk out our own faith and our own mission. So we're going to make two observations today, ways that I think that we can learn to be missional, ways that I think that we can look at the story and learn what it looks like to reach Katie for Jesus. And here's the first one. It's be ready to do whatever it takes. See, I think we tend to get this idea when we look at the paralytic's friend because it says that they lowered him through the roof, right? So what they did, what we think, is we look at this roof of palm leaves and we think they were like, picked him up and laid him over. And they lowered the guy down. And I get that because in all fairness, this is actually how they repaired roofs back then, as they would. They would pull things off and they would lay them down. But the NIV says they dug into it. And if you go all the way back to the original Greek translation, there is a forcefulness to the way that they are digging down into this roof. See, they were going to get to Jesus, whatever it took. They couldn't get to him through the crowd. They couldn't get to him through a window, through a doorway. So they did what they could. They got on top of the house. They ripped away the roof. And they lowered the man down. And I don't know about you, but lowering people down is not that easy. And I have a story for you about that. <laughs> it's not about me. Don't worry. I'm not going to embarrass myself today. I am going to embarrass my brother. So I was 13. So this was about 12 years ago. Not to carbon date people in the room. But about 12 years ago, my stepbrother was getting married in New Orleans, Louisiana. Okay, and he gets married in the Audubon Zoo something. I don't know. It's like attached to the zoo. It's like this big room. I and mean, this is a big fancy thing. I, I owned one suit at this point. My brother owned none because he really wants to be a country boy. He does, 100%. We grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. You're near the country, but that's the city. But he was like, I'm country. I was like, all right, whatever. So he wears this suit, right? And he, I mean, he hates it. He's got the ties all buttoned down. Well, my sister, on the other hand, loves to dress up, loves to do all these things. So she is, of course, dressed in a nice formal dress. And they've got a big black tie band that's playing. And everybody's slow dancing. They're doing all these songs. So my sister looks at my brother and goes, Rush, come dance with me. So they do. And Rush can't dance, so it's real just like basic stuff, you know. But at one point, I guess my brother gets this confidence. He's like, I'm going to dip my sister. <laughs> and I will let you know, my sister is tiny. She's not very big, okay? And my brother's a football player. So he's big. So you would think this would translate to going down, coming back up. There are 200 people at this place probably. My brother dips her, laughs, drops her. <laughs> In front of everyone. In front of everyone. And my sister's like, rush! What is wrong with you? Do you know how embarrassing this is? He goes, I thought it would be easier to get you back up. <laughs> See, it's a lot easier to lower people down than it is to get them back up. And there's no difference here, right? It was no different in this situation. The act of lowering the paralytic down through the roof took faith because here's the deal. They were not getting him back up out of this roof. It's not like they have this complicated lever system. They just lowered him down, probably with ropes in their hands. So he was not getting back up the way he came out. But they were willing to do whatever it took to get their friend in front of Jesus. And see, we have to do the same thing. We've got to do whatever it takes to reach this city for Jesus. Because here's the reality. Jesus, counterculture, completely goes against what the world has out there. People are not just busting through the doors to get in here. We have got to go get them. And so what this looks like is we're going to have to do different things. We're going to have to try new things altogether. For the church, this means trying new methods. It means doing things entirely different from before. It might mean changing the way that we have thought about entire ministries. And I even have a practical thing to talk to you guys about this. Um, if any of you have talked to Nathan in the past month, you have probably heard him say something about our Facebook ads. Anybody? Three of you. Cool. So <laughs> let me fill everybody else in then. So for those of you that did not know, about a month ago, um, 
I love YouTube, mainly because it is a black hole of useless information. But every once in a while, you can go in there and you can find some things that are really practical. And there's this guy on there, a uh, guy named George Abbott. He literally, all his entire life is based on is helping churches grow. So I start working for a, a new church, so what am I thinking? Okay, let's find some ways to grow. So one of his things, he's like, run Facebook ads for your church. I have never run a Facebook ad in my life, never thought about it, never wanted to do it, didn't care about it. But I said, you know what? Maybe. So I come to a staff meeting and I tell Nathan, I'm like, look, there was this idea um, this guy had and I want to try it. I was like, it's completely against the way I would do everything. We were going to create a Facebook ad. We were going to whip out an iPhone, not a camera, an iPhone. We were going to shoot a selfie video of Nathan and Lil. Nathan will tell you all the time, he is technologically impaired. So we're trying to get him, right, to like position this right. And Lil keeps like bumping his hand up because Nathan's got like half their head cut off. But we record this video, and you can go back and find it, and it's basically Nathan and Lil, and he goes, hey, my name's Nathan Rahmer, uh, this is my wife Lil, I'm the pastor of a new church here in Katy, and this is the whole video, it said, we'd love to pray for you, so if you reach out to us, one of our pastors will personally reach out and pray for you. And we send it out to Facebook. My mind goes, there's no way that's working, there's no way anybody's responding, I wasn't that hopeful. We didn't even spend a lot of money on the ads, ads get expensive by the way, just so you know. In one month of doing this, we only ran the ad for two weeks, by the way, we reached 2,500 new people, and we got to pray for 16 different people who reached out to us. See, doing things differently, trying new things, doing things a way that we would have never thought about them before gave us the opportunity to meet people where they are and to bring them to Jesus. And so for you personally, this is going to mean similar things. This is the reality of what we have to do to reach people. It means that you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone. It means talking to new people. It means reaching out to the people that are very difficult in your life. It means being committed even in the face of rejection. We have to be willing to do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. And here's what I love about this passage. Is this man is healed by Jesus because of his friends. And I think that's a detail that we miss sometimes, right? Make no mistake, the paralytic had faith. He was not being healed unless he got up. But that man did not lay at the feet of Jesus because he just appeared there. He was brought there. And see, my story isn't much different. I'm not going to go into my whole salvation story for you guys. We'd be here for an hour and a half. But I did not just wander into the doors of a church. I grew up going to a church when I was about three, and then I left. My dad's a doctor. He's an incredibly busy man. We couldn't make it on Sundays most of the time. So until I was 15 years old, I just didn't go to church. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't care about going to youth ministry. I didn't want to do anything. But what my friends did, I had two guys, a guy named Josh Gaddy and a guy named Chandler Key, is they hounded on me day after day after day after day to act right, to talk right, to maybe show up to church. And finally, Gaddy, when he got to the point where he could drive, he just texted me one Sunday and he said, I'm pulling up to your house in five minutes. Get in the car. You're going to small groups. And I went, all right. What ended up happening is that six months into me doing that, I gave my life to Christ in February of 2010, and my life has been changed ever since. See, I did not walk to Jesus on my own. It was a long fight to get me to the feet of Jesus, but my friends did whatever it took to get me there, and I'm very thankful for what they did. See, just like the paralytics, friends, they were committed to do whatever it took to see me experience the power of Jesus. And these paralytics, friends, they did that too. They took whatever they could to get their friend to experience the power of Jesus. And that's got to be the way that we respond today. See, there are people around you. You have next-door neighbors. There are people you walk by in the grocery store. There's people you see every day, probably at work, probably in your own family, that have no clue who Jesus is. They may think they do. They may not. But they don't know who Jesus is, and they want to experience Jesus. You have an obligation, believe it or not, to bring those people to Jesus. And it's not just going to happen because you walked up to him one time and went, Jesus loves you. Not saying that's bad. But this is going to be a knockdown, drag out, continual fight, continual struggle 
a committed response to the gospel that changed us and we want it to change other people. And we have to do whatever it takes. So here's the second observation. We have to shift to a missional mindset. So this is the kind of follow-up to what we just talked about, right? The idea that we've got to do whatever it takes. And so this house Jesus is in is full of people enamored by Jesus. They're interested in him. They're curious about him. And there are absolutely people in that room who have faith in Jesus at this point. But what I love is that the people in that crowd, they are not the focus of the story. Instead, what the story focuses on is these four friends. See, the reason is these four friends chose to take action. And so here we are today. We are sitting in the presence of Jesus right now, just like those people were 2,000 years ago. So we're good, right? We did it. We made it. This is what we're called to. Or is it? Is this really what we're called to do? Is this the Christian life that we're supposed to live? See, if we're looking at the example of the four friends, I think we really need to ask ourselves, are we living out the faith that's really portrayed in the Gospels? Because I think if we look at the example of the four friends, we see something different. We see the embodiment of one of Jesus' greatest commandments, the Great Commission. And if you don't know it, here it is. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, when that command was given, now Jesus had already resurrected at this point, right? He was preparing for the growth and the birth of his church that was going to sweep across Europe. It was going to sweep across Asia and eventually would even make its way to the Western Hemisphere where we are today. But at this point in the story, in Mark 2, when you have the healing of the paralytic, Jesus had just begun his ministry, much less died on the cross. But see, the core of what the Great Commission is can be seen in these friends. The entire focus of the Great Commission is that people are brought to the feet of Jesus. That's what it is. That is the goal of what it is. And I think one of the coolest things about the healing of the paralytic is that when everybody else rushes to Jesus on their own, they're just worried about them getting to see Jesus. They're worried about them hearing the teaching of Jesus. They're worried that maybe they can get a little bit of the healing of Jesus. These four friends do not think a thing about themselves. What's the first thing they do? we got a friend who needs healing. Let's take him. See, it's great that we have a church full of spiritually growing people. That is honoring to God. But if we are living our life focused on the mission of Jesus, we would be laying people at his feet every week. Every single week. See, but this missional mindset will not come naturally to us. This is something that we have to learn. It's something that is going to take reconfiguring ourselves. And there's this old saying that we used to repeat all the time when coaching, and most of you are probably going to know this. Choices make actions, actions make habits, and habits make no one, lifestyles. <laughs> Not a lot of coaches in the room, it's fun. Choices make actions, actions make habits, habits make lifestyles. See, so you wake up every morning, you make a choice of who you're going to be. You make a choice of what you do. Most of you make the choice of what you wear, what you eat. Believe it or not, you make a choice of how you're going to act. Now, some of that is just conditioned into you at this point. I may be one of the weirdest people on this planet. I put one sock and one shoe on at a time if I can handle it. It's different if I'm wearing pants because I don't like to, like, pull the socks back up under my pants. That's something I learned at a young age, and it is now ingrained in me, right? Right? And we all do the same thing. You have a routine when you wake up. We are creatures of habit by nature, and we do not like people to mess up our routine. So when we have to change the way that we think, it's easy to look at this and go, I am not missional. I don't know how to talk to people. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to bring people here. It's weird. It's uncomfortable inviting people. I am telling you that is something that you can unlearn. 
You have to choose to be missional. And then you get to take action on that. And the more you do that, those actions turn into habits. And then eventually, here we go. Are you ready for this? If you make a daily effort for this, you'll see this mindset slowly shift until reaching Katie for Jesus becomes our lifestyle, not our goal. It is a constant effort that is going to take time, but it's worth it. See, I want to see God do miraculous things at Cary City. I want to see the power, the resurrection power invading this city. And I believe that each and every one of you get to play a major part in that. I do. I 100% do. And so as we end today, as we're getting ready to end, I want to give you two challenges, two things that we can take. So we had two observations that we know that it's going to take being ready to do whatever it takes, and it's going to take us shifting to a missional mindset. So how do we do that? I think one of the first things that we can do is reflect and ask ourselves three simple questions. The first one is, am I reaching people for Jesus? Am I sharing the gospel? Am I inviting people to church? I know that sounds old school. But we've got to bring people to Jesus. And here's the third one. Am I discipling people? It's not enough just to go, Jesus loves you. We are supposed to teach people what this life looks like. This is the mission of the church. This is what we are engaged in. This is what we committed to do when we gave our life to Jesus. Just like Paul on the road to Damascus where God said, you are going to suffer for my name. Paul said, I'll do it. Are we committed to the mission of of Jesus. See, these questions are important because they force us to be honest with ourselves and realize the areas that we need to work on. And once we know where we're falling behind, now we know where we need to step up. And those are things that we can work on together. And so here's the last thing. So we reflect, and here's what we do. We act. There's two things that I think we can do. We can serve one and bring one. That's really simple. This is really easy, and I'll explain it to you. Here's the first thing. Serve one person this week. I'm not asking you to go serve the 1.2 million people that live in a 15-mile radius of this church. I'm asking you to go serve one person. And here's the second thing. I want you to do everything in your power to bring one person next Sunday. Make it your life's mission to bring someone to church. Message them, call them, do whatever it takes. See, these small acts, because they're not very big things, right, realistically, in the grand scheme of things, these small acts help you to choose to be missional, which leads to action, which leads to this becoming a habit in your life until it becomes your life. We can learn to do this together. And I'll share a story with you why I think this is so important. Senior year of high school, um, I'd been a believer for two years. I had a Bible teacher by the name of Paul Epperson. I went to a private school, so I got Bible in school. Um, And he had this thing that he started doing with us where he would take us after school some days and we would go to this mall. We have a mall called Metro Center. It is absolutely run down. There's like nothing in it. Used to have a DMV in it. Now it's just like some shoe stores and cell phone stores. That's it. It's all that's in there. But what we would do is once a week we would go to this mall and we would do a couple of things. We had gospel tracts that we would hand out and that ought to ring a bell for some of you because I don't know anybody that still has gospel tracts, but we would give out gospel tracts, and we would actually start talking to people and just sharing the gospel with them. We would ask them questions. Um, Usually, the questions would would revolve around something along the idea of, hey, what do you think happens when we die? And that question usually leads people to go, well, I believe, blah, 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 blah. And then we're like, great, now we're in. We can talk. And so I walked up to this guy. One day, he was the owner of a cell phone store, um, and I asked him the same question. And first thing out of his mouth, he said, something, something, Allah. So I was like, okay, he's a Muslim, so let's talk about this. So this guy, he and I had four different conversations over the the course of a month. Every single one of them was about two hours in length. And this guy would talk with me back and forth about the parallels of our religions. We would talk about the differences in our religions because there are some similarities, right? And we would walk through this over and over and over again. And one thing that really bothered him was the fact that we believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he's a God, right? Not that Jesus is a real person because they believe that Jesus was a prophet, but the fact that we believe that he is God. And here's something that he said to me, and it has stuck with me ever since. It's one sentence. He said, if you, talking about Christians, believe in this God, 
who is so powerful, so loving, so mighty, the Savior, why do you tell no one about him? Did you know that Christianity is one of the fastest declining religions in America? See, we can change that. We can change the very idea that people have about our God. We can change the idea that people have about our faith. We can change this entire city. See, I want to see us break the norms of how Christians are viewed. I want to see people that see how well we love. I want people to see how much we reach out. I want people to be annoyed with the level of Jesus that we bring to them. See, I want to see God take over Katie. And if I'm being completely honest with you, I want to see God take over this whole area, the whole area of Houston. And that's a big number. It's a big task. But see, I believe that God has big things in store for us here. I think he's just getting started. But this is going to take us being committed to this together, walking out our faith and bringing people to the feet of Jesus. And if we do that, we are living out the mission of the gospel. In just a second, we're going to worship. Um, and I'm going to pray for you guys. And what we're going to do is, if you need prayer, I will be in the back. And I would love to pray for you. But what I really want you guys to do is to take this time together. We're going to sing two more songs. And I want you to spend some time in reflection. I want you to spend some time and say, God, am I being the person you called me to be? God, am I living the life that you have called me to do? God, if that is not where I am, what do I need to do? What is my next step? And as we walk out these doors today, don't let those be empty words. But let's respond to God's calling. Let's respond to the life that God has called us to live. And we will see God do miraculous things through us. Let's pray.